Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Midweek Sensation. Using my, I was using my best announcer voice there on you. Known as the Midland Church Bible Study. Good to have you tonight. Glad to see you, and welcome to those who are tuning in via the World Wide Web all over the globe. We're glad to have you with us tonight as well as we study the Word and dig in to the beauties of our Lord Jesus. Hope to show you some good, lovely stuff tonight. I'm going to be talking tonight about Christ's proclamation of the kingdom. I've done a lot of kingdom preaching lately. I'm tr really just trying to establish our hearts the same way we've established our hearts on grace. We've established our hearts on a finished work, trying to establish our hearts on the kingdom of the dear Son. It's the kingdom that Paul said we are already in. You have been translated out of one kingdom into the other. Yet, as you know by my preaching, I think we are woefully uninformed of the kingdom. I mean, we're in a kingdom. We don't know much about it. In fact, most Christians would put the kingdom in its full possession somewhere else. And that's, I think, what's hurting us. Until we can put ourselves in that kingdom of which Jesus didn't say was going to slowly come upon us, but rather Jesus in his own day, 2,000 years ago, said, kingdom's in the midst. That was then. So where are we now? Well, unless the kingdom ran away, some people will say to you the kingdom went out with Jesus, which if that's the case, then Paul was very confused because Paul said, you have been translated from one kingdom to the next. So we... I mean, I, I, mean I, can, I can go along with the idea that Jesus left, because I see that in my text. I can't go along with the idea that the king took his kingdom with him. So what I believe is that the kingdom is here, and you're in it, and Christ is in you, the hope of glory. The fullness of that kingdom granted. There is a lot of things we don't know, and there's a lot of things we're going to know. But what we don't know that we should know now is shameful when we can know it. I can't teach you what's on the next dimension. But I can teach you according to the word what's supposed to be in this one based upon the kingdom. And so let's look at Christ's proclamation of the kingdom. We have been in the book of John for weeks. Tonight we go to Luke. <laughs> you thought we were going back to John, didn't you? Just by, just by the way I introed it. We are going to the book of Luke. It is the third gospel of four, the third book of your New Testament. And just, and I'm, I'm, I'm telling you this, it's going to sound like we're doing a study on the book of Luke. We're not, but I'm telling you this for a reason. Uh, and I think we mentioned this during the John series, actually. Luke is the one gospel out of four that most theologians, historians, Greek scholars believe was written in chronological order. In other words, Luke more than Matthew, Mark, and John, tried to show you a left-to-right progressive timeline of the life of Christ. He gives you a genealogy because Luke is a gospel, the gospel of the man, Jesus. And he gives you, just like a man, almost like a biography. Announcement of birth, birth, um, what was going on just before he arrives on the scene, early ministry, on into his ministry. Then the passion gets a lot of play in the book of Luke. We get a lot of stuff about Calvary. In fact, Luke's the only gospel, the only book that uses the word Calvary. That was a little free tidbit for you there in case you wondered where you might find the word Calvary. It's in the book of Luke. But in Luke, we find some interesting stuff. I'd love to, we, we, and we may do, 
we, we do a lot of extensive studies in certain books. Luke is a great look at that life of Christ left to right. Uh, keep that in mind, but don't get married to the idea, okay? We, we don't really know for sure if everything's in order, but keep that in mind as you study it. It's, uh, it's, it's commonly believed to be that way. I want to be in the fourth chapter. I want to show you a story, and I kind of fell in love with doing this during the John series, and that's reading the whole story. So I'm going to do that again tonight. I'm going to read the whole story, and I'm going to, with minimal commentary, and then I'm going to go back, okay? Because, and the reason I'm going to do it tonight, it's not just because I enjoy doing it, but I think it really will help. I want you to watch the whole story. At the end of the, I'll give you a warning. At the end of this story, something bizarre is going to occur that I in my whole life have never heard commented on, never heard preached. And so that's the kind of stuff that when I get revelation or insight on stuff, that's the kind of stuff I can't wait to get up and talk about. So um, uh, let, let's dig in. Luke chapter 4, beginning in verse 14. Then Jesus returned in the power. Returned from where? This is from the wilderness. Remember 40 days, 40 nights he hadn't, he's been fasting and he gets tempted to the devil. Jesus returns in the power of the Spirit to Galilee and news of him went out throughout all the surrounding region. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, that would be Saturday, and he stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The indication there is that Jesus turned to the place where it was written. And for your own notes, he turns to what we would call Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1. They wouldn't have called it that. It was just Isaiah. Hadn't been broke up into chapters yet. 18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, old King James says bruised, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. I propose to you that all eyes were fixed on him, not because he was a good reader, all eyes were fixed on him because of what he left out of the text. We'll get to that in a little bit. So all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. Why are they gracious? They're gracious because of what he left out. <laughs> You'll see it. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, you will surely say this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. Then he said, Assuredly, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heaven was shut up three and a half years. And there was a great famine throughout all the land. But to none of them was Elijah sent except to Zarephath in the region of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet. And none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. So all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. Please write in the word. This is the Greek word. They were filled with rage. And I don't know that your old King James doesn't use that word. I don't know. It's wrath. The, the Greek is rage. They were all filled with rage and rose up and thrust him out of the city. And they led him to the brow of the hill. There's a 75-foot sheer cliff drop-off outside the city of Nazareth on which their city was built that they might throw him down over the cliff. Then passing through the midst of them, he went his way. Now here's what I have not seen commented on, and I am bumfazzled when I see verse number 28. All those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with rage. Ladies and gentlemen, we read this together. Hopefully you were following along. I wanted to read it top to bottom so that you would see that at no point in this story, did Jesus do anything that ought to make a group go so mad with fury that they physically grab him, drag him outside of the city walls, and threaten to throw him off of a 75-foot cliff? What did he do or say in this paragraph that caused his audience to get so filled with rage they would lose their human faculties and turn into a pack of dogs? Because that's what happens right here. 
These good religious people on a Saturday afternoon in the synagogue completely lose their composure and grab a grown man and drag him outside the walls of a city to throw him off of a 75-foot cliff. And the best thing I can come up with is he said a couple things about Elijah and a couple things about Elisha, but he never makes a pointed comment. He doesn't call anybody a, a, like John the Baptist would a brood of vipers. Uh, he, he doesn't call them dogs or open sepulchers. He saves some of those statements for later in his ministry. So what is it about this that is so bad? That's what I want to dig into tonight. Because I propose to you that tonight what Jesus does in this chapter is Jesus gives the first public proclamation of the kingdom. And the pill doesn't go down any better the day he said it then than it does right now. We may call ourselves more civil because nobody will drag you out in the parking lot and try to throw you over into the river. But in Jesus' day, maybe civility was out the window or maybe what he was proclaiming was just so world-changing, so life-changing to these Jews listening to that day that it would cause them to lose themselves in rage. This is what I want to dig into tonight. The proclamation, Christ's proclamation of the kingdom. Now let's go back, particularly starting in the 17th verse, to get into the meat of what Jesus has to say. I've already tipped my hand and told you that Jesus was reading from Isaiah 61. You know, before we're done, we're going to compare those scriptures. Okay? But for purposes of getting us started in the lesson, look at 17. He was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. That means they gave him the book. This was the book that was supposed to get read out of today. He didn't say, give me Isaiah. So he walked in, the Holy Spirit had already preordained that the, the sermon, quote-unquote sermon of the day, was going to be from Isaiah. And when he opened the book, he found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And then he gives you six things in the old King James and in the new King James. I'm not going to make a big deal out of the number here, okay? But in the original, in the earliest manuscripts of the Greek translation, the phrase, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, is not in the earliest translation. So it goes from a six-point proclamation to a five-point proclamation. But I'm not going to get too, too heady into that tonight, okay? I don't want to fight about whether it is or not. Um, there's a lot of things got left out of early translations that I think were inspired, and then I look at some stuff and see it in the early... And they're in there, and I wonder if they were inspired. Uh, I'm not to be the judge of that, and you've you got to handle that on your own. But I do know this. In Revelation, I think it's to the church at Thyatira, for him that overcomes, he gets to see the morning star. And the Jews had a belief that that morning star was a five-pointed star. And, that, and a lot of theologians have made a connection that at the proclamation of the kingdom in Luke chapter 4, Jesus was giving a five-point kingdom proclamation, which would be the, the morning star. So Jesus was saying the, star, the morning star is now shining on the earth. Here is that proclamation of the kingdom. Again, we can get into a discussion whether it's five or six. I don't want, really want to worry too much about it. Let's just deal with all of them that's on the text, okay? Whether or not they were in the original Greek, we not, will not be too concerned with. Starting at the top, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. Notice that the Holy Spirit had come upon Jesus to anoint him. When did the Holy Spirit come upon Jesus to anoint him? At his bapt at when he came up out of the Jordan River, what happened? The Spirit descended in the form of a dove. That doesn't mean the Holy Ghost is a dove, but in the form of a dove and rested on Jesus. And the heavens opened. The Father said, this is my beloved Son. I talked about this Sunday morning. This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. God vocalized what he thought about Jesus. Jesus uses that equipment to go into the wilderness and face the devil. The first temptation of the devil is if you are really the Son of God. And so Jesus has to be equipped with the knowledge that he is the Son of God. He, is gr he has grown into the knowledge, and I dared to, to cross this line Sunday morning, I know. I think it was Sunday morning. Sometimes they run together. But I dared cross this line recently in the pulpit and said, I don't believe Jesus had it all figured out his whole life because he grew in wisdom with God and with men. What's the purpose in growing in wisdom with God if you got all the wisdom with God the day he was born? And so that's Bible. So Jesus is growing in wisdom. That doesn't mean Jesus is out here making mistakes. Don't get me wrong. It means that Jesus comes into a fuller knowledge every day about who he is, what his purpose is, and, what, and why he's here. Okay? That's not to denigrate his knowledge at all. In fact, it's to give credence to the Holy Spirit who guided Jesus the same way the Holy Spirit wants to guide you. How many of you 
and don't raise your hand for sake of embarrassment, but how many of you could say that you are better now at listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit than you were the day you got saved? Well, I hope you are. Unfortunately, the way we've designed our churches in America, we actually stunt people's growth by not allowing them to listen to the Holy Spirit after they get saved. Instead, we give them all of our rules, regulations, lists, and stuff in place of the Holy Spirit. And I know I'm on a soapbox. In place of the Holy Spirit, because frankly, we don't trust that the Holy Spirit will really tell you how to live right. We're afraid that if you just listen to him, you might end up living like the church down the street. And we want you living like our church. And so we, we're not really sure if you'll do that. So we'll give you this little book. Go read it, study it. We'll give you a test. We'll call you a member. But the Holy Ghost knows what he's doing. And so Jesus allowed the Holy Ghost every day. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he hath anointed me. So Jesus is proclaiming whatever I'm about to say to you, I give credence to the Holy Spirit for having shown me this. He doesn't say this when he's 12. He doesn't say this when he's 18. He doesn't say this when he's 25. He says it when he's 30. Right out of the wilderness, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me now. And here's what he's anointed me to do. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, number one. Number two, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Number three, to proclaim liberty to the captives. Number four, recovering of sight to the blind. Number five, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Number six, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And just as we did two Sundays ago in a message called uh, Fit for the Kingdom and That Which Won't Fit into the Kingdom, we broke down the Apostle Paul's letter to Galatian and, uh, and to Colossae when he said, these things don't belong. There's no Jew, there's no Gentile, there's no male, there's no female, there's no bond, there's no free, there's no barbarian, there's no Scythian, there's no circumcised, there's no uncircumcised, all this stuff. And we told you that in the kingdom of God, there's no room for racism, there's no room for classism, there's no room for sexism, there's just no room for it. This isn't something we're supposed to be progressing into. It's something we're supposed to know. It's something that's supposed to happen in us in our hearts. Okay? Um, there, there's always been people who are ahead of the curve because they're in the kingdom. Let me tell you something about you, whether you realize it or not. If you're in the kingdom, you're ahead of the curve. It might take your nation a while to catch up, but you're ahead of the curve. While there were still Americans enslaving Americans because one American's skin was the wrong color, there was always somebody in the kingdom ahead of the curve who said, this ain't right. And everybody else made fun of the one that said, this ain't right. But he went, look, in God's kingdom, there can't be any difference in a black man and a white man. There can't be. Otherwise, what would Jesus go to the cross to die for? And everybody who was cut down and opposed and fought against for trying to make social revolution, a lot of them were just tipping their cap to the future. I love that. I, I stole that tip your cap to the future line. I, I heard E. Stanley Jones, an old preacher from 30 years ago, say he was in college at the turn of the 20th century, 1900. He said, I was riding a trolley car in my university city. He said, I was sitting next to a woman, and he said, a black woman got on the trolley, and I got up to give her my seat, and he said, everybody in the trolley shook their head and went. And he said, but what they didn't realize is I was tipping my cap to the future because I was in the kingdom, where in the kingdom it didn't matter what color she was. He said, it took my country 65 years to catch up, but I jumped in the kingdom that soon. I, man, stuff like when I, when I heard that, that fired me up because I went, you know, I know exactly what's, what's happening now. I, I started having stuff vividly explained to me in the spirit realm. What's happening in opening, flinging wide the doors and saying, come in. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what everybody thinks about you. Come in, all you that labor and are heavy laden. Christ will give you rest. We don't care what your reputation is. We don't care what your story is. We don't care what your background is. We don't care what t-shirt you're wearing, how you cut your hair, what kind of nose ring you got in. Come on in. That you may get rejected everywhere else, but we're tipping our cap to the future where we've stopped putting you into a class. And that's, Jesus is introducing that here. Look at some of the stuff he says. I'll move quick. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. We always take this in the church and go, well, what Jesus meant was Jesus came to preach the gospel to those who are spiritually poor. And so if you're not spiritually poor, you're never going to be spiritually rich. And so we always try to add words where they're not there. But in Jesus' audience was a whole lot of poor people. And Jesus said, good news. The church ain't never had nothing to do with you but steal your money. The church ain't never had nothing to do with you but tell you what to do. He said, I got good news. What's gospel mean? Jesus said, I got good news for the poor man. He was tipping his cap. <laughs> he was tipping his cap to the future. The apostle Paul would pick that cap up in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and say, Jesus was made poor so that you could be made rich. <laughs> Jesus was just tipping his cap. Some, nobody got it, but Jesus got it. He was proclaiming, this is the way it's going to be in the kingdom. Listen up. You don't have much. 
There's no economic difference in the kingdom. You are not disqualified because you don't have enough money to put in the offering. You are not disqualified because you grew up on the wrong side of the tracks. You are not disqualified from the, from the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. In God's kingdom, there is no such thing as the rich guy gets to set up here and the poor guy has to set back there. The Apostle Paul would tell the church, don't find the best seat in the house for the most famous man in town. That's what he told the church of Corinth. Don't reserve seats on the front row for him. They don't work that way in the kingdom. In the kingdom, everybody is the same in the eyes of God. Let them all be the same. Good news to the poor. He's going to heal the brokenhearted. Whether or not in the earliest Greek or not, I still love it. Because there's people who have broken hearts. And Jesus came along and said, in the kingdom, what I'm bringing to you is people who have broken hearts don't have to just deal with it. I'll heal them. In the world system, where you're not in the kingdom, people will tell you that's just life. That's just the way it is. Deal with it. Go get some therapy. Go get counseled. Go get taken. And there's nothing wrong with some therapy and counseling. But Jesus didn't come to counsel your broken heart. Jesus came to heal your broken heart. He didn't come to walk you through it. He came to sew it up. You give the kingdom a little bit of time with a broken heart, and it'll start fixing broken hearts. Not just in one Sunday, two Sundays. Give him time. Let the king sit on a throne in his kingdom and watch him heal broken hearts. Third, I'm going to give liberty to the captives. I think this is social, socially and politically captive. He's going to give liberty to people who are socially captive, who are captive by their government, who are captive by their laws. The kingdom didn't just come to be a spiritual entity sitting on a church corner and us to have 15 or 20 different flavors of them in our town. The kingdom come in Christ so that the church could be the body and Christ could be the head and that in Christ man would find his true liberty. Your freedom is free. Do you hear that? Your freedom is free. Why? Because Jesus paid for all of it. You don't have to pay for any of your freedom. Your freedom is His freedom. His freedom is your freedom. I came to proclaim liberty to the captives. To recover sight to the blind. What was He doing in recovering sight to the blind? You can file this away for a moment. This is added by Jesus. This one isn't in Isaiah 61. We'll find that in a moment. Jesus throws this one in for good measure. How many of you realize that the guy that writes the book has the rights to write the update? Don't get mad that Jesus changed the scripture he wrote the first time. You can come back with a second version and go, I changed a couple things. Jesus come along and said, I'm going I'm to heal. I'm going to give, recover sight to the blind. I think this is the kingdom is for everyone who's physically lost, who has physical problems. Because Jesus wanted you to know that in the kingdom of God, there is healing. I was writing for my new book just the other day, and I got, man, I was just all hip deep up in the 53rd chapter. Of Isaiah, that's why I come in here and preach some of this stuff sometime because I walk right out of that office and go, well, I got to go tell somebody, you know, can't just wait for it to get published. And so, but I was up just, just up in that 53rd chapter. That's why I come out of the gate going, surely he hath born. Because that, that word surely burned in my heart this week when I was writing. Why does God have to say surely he hath born all of this stuff? Because the world has never believed that the kingdom could manifest in the physical. It's always been a spiritual thing. You know why Jesus gave you some physical in this? Because he didn't want his audience to go, well, praise God, the kingdom's spiritually here. We're going to receive. Because that's what I've heard in the church my whole life. Go, well, we're talking about a spiritual kingdom. And Jesus said, physically, I'm going to recover sight to the blind. He didn't say, I'm going to set my throne up in Rome. I'm going to build a temple in Jerusalem. What he did say was, I'm going to manifest in the physical. I'm going to touch your body. I'm literally going to show up and administer healing in somebody. And what was so awesome about him saying recovering sight to the blind, in the entire Old Testament canon of Scripture, not one person, not one person had ever been healed of blindness. And then came Jesus. Hey, man, somebody had even been raised from the dead in the Old Testament. So Jesus went ahead and picked a miracle nobody had ever had performed. Lepers had been raised, the dead had been raised, but nobody had ever had their sight recovered that was blind. Man felt like it was impossible. So Jesus throws it in and said, in the kingdom, I'm even going to bring sight back to the blind. 
Next one, I'm going to set free or set at liberty those who, my new King James says oppress. The original, I think oppressed is pressed. The old King James says bruised. Set at liberty them that are bruised. But this is morally and spiritually lost. The kingdom is going to reach people who are morally and spiritually bankrupt. They have been bruised, and God's going to set them free. That's what the kingdom's here to do. Now, we live in a world that I, I, I'm, you know as well as I do that's pretty morally bankrupt. They're morally and spiritually lost. They're looking for direction. Well, my heart breaks when I see a lot of the stuff that's going on out in the world, not because I'm, I'm sitting back like I used to going, boy, God's going to judge them. Boy, I, you know, I hope I'm not there when the lightning bolt, bolt falls. But now I look at them and say, man, some of these people are searching in every hell hole on earth to try to find what I have found in Christ and what Christ is in me. And I can't be greedy and set on it. I've got to go spread some kingdom into this person's life. I've got to let them know, you know, life's a little bit better than this. Jesus came to, to set at liberty those of you that are bruised. Bruised spiritually. I, I, you know, I, I shared something with you Sunday, and I know I'm eating up time, but I love talking to you about the Word, so forgive me. And we, if we go a couple minutes long, just, you know, don't throw me over a 75-foot cliff and, and get mad with rage. But I shared some stuff with you Sunday morning, and I, I walked out of the pulpit, both services, and I, I said, you know, I don't know if I'll put that over TV, and I'm still debating whether I will. Not, not the whole sermon, but the, the first five minutes or so. Um, be, because I, I shared some stuff with you about how I feel about the church. I love the church, and I want to make it very, very clear. I love the body of Christ. I've been in the church my whole life. It's really all that I know. I wouldn't be very good out in the world doing the st living by their system because I would be, you know, I'm, I'd be lost. <laughs> I wouldn't know what, uh, I wouldn't know how to function. But, uh, and I'm not saying that for any other reason to let you know that I'm an advocate of the church. So when I say things like I did Sunday that goes, sometimes the church makes me sick, I'm not talking about, you know, my, my church makes me sick. I'm talking about uh, the church, what we've, what we've come to represent makes me sick. What we've come to stand for makes me sick. What we've come to identify ourselves by makes me sick. We're better than this. And we're embarrassing the kingdom. I mean, we are, that ain't meant to condemn everybody. It's just meant, hey, when are we going to slap ourselves and, and be like the prodigal son, quit slopping hogs and go, man, we've got we to fix something. This ain't the way it's supposed to be. We, we got all wrapped up in what you wear and what your building looked like and what side of the tracks you were on and, and uh, who preached in your church three times a year and just silliness. We got, we got all wrapped up in competing. I mean, if the, early, if the apostles came back, jumped in a time machine, came to America, they, they wouldn't be able to figure out why we got 25 different flavors of the same Jesus in one town. They would just, they, what, what, I mean, you, you believe he died for you? Why can't we get along? But we can't get along because, you know, you got chairs and we got pews and you got strobe lights and we don't. You got a smoke machine, we got a smoke machine. Everybody down there wears jeans. We like to wear suits. And listen, a lot of taste and preferences come in. You know what's happened to the world? They've been spiritually, they've spiritually been bruised. So they walk past the church and go, forget that, bunch of fakes and hypocrites. I had someone sit in my office today, talk to me for three hours. They got to the end of the conversation. He said, well, be quite frank with you, pastor. I don't trust preachers. So I don't trust preachers, and here's why. And then here came the laundry list of stuff that had happened to them from pastors. And every single description, it ain't no business who it was or what it was, but every single description was because that pastor didn't understand his job wasn't to lead a, to build a church, and his job wasn't just to get up and preach. His job was to spread the kingdom. That was the problem. And as I sit and listen, I say, God, just help me be a kingdom spreader. I don't care if we build a church. I don't care if the sermons are stylistic, uh, uh, illustrated perfectly. They come out just, we want to spread kingdom. God, we can't do that. Listen, we can't just do that on a Sunday morning. We can't just do that on a Wednesday night. That's what our problem is in America is we've become a place where we feel like Sunday morning, Wednesday night is the whole bulk of who we are. That's why we spend 95% of our whole evangelism in this whole world happens in 10 minutes at the end of a service around a bench while someone sings coming home. 95% of our evangelism is at the end of a service in church in a place where there's not even that many sinners. And we wonder why we're not spreading the kingdom and why people walk by our front door and go, forget that, man, that's a waste. I know those people. I know how every one of them live. And Jesus said, I came to put the kingdom in the middle of people's lives who are spiritually and morally bruised. This got him in a lot of trouble with scribes and Pharisees, I can tell you, because he would always turn the guns of hell, not on lost people, but on saved people. 
Jesus never threatened one sinner in the Gospels with hell. But he did like to pull it out of his bag when he was talking to preachers. You ever notice that? He did like to pull it out whenever he was talking to the church. He was good at it. He seemed to leave it alone when he met adulterers and fornicators and tax collectors and prostitutes. For them, he poured on grace and forgiveness. For everybody else, he told them about hell. I got a little theory for that, but you probably already heard that. Set free the bruised. Finally, and I gotta, I, we do have to speed up a little bit, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. This is very important because what Jesus was saying, the acceptable year of the Lord, was the Jewish way of saying the year of Jubilee. And the year of Jubilee, every 50th year on the Jewish calendar, every debt rolled back, properties returned to the original owner, cattle, whatever. All debts were cleared at the 50th year. Do you know why God did this? God did it every 50th year because... The kingdom was about establishing equality across the board. The year of Jubilee brought everybody back to square one. And when Jesus said, I came to proclaim Jubilee, the acceptable year of the Lord, what Jesus was saying is when I introduce kingdom, it's going to put you all at the exact same place where the ground is level at the foot of the cross. I'm going to reestablish the year of Jubilee, a return of equality. Jesus was really saying, I proclaim the year of Jubilee. I proclaim a whole new world. Now, Jesus knew what you and I know. The kingdom could not be ushered in until the sacrifice for sin was paid. So the beginning of kingdom would be with Jesus who said the king's in the midst of you. But man couldn't get into the kingdom through anything but pressing by works until jesus went to the cross and at calvary when jesus would die for our sins raise again three days later he would put life in all of those who would believe by faith the holy ghost came in at pentecost and it, like gasoline to the engine provided the church with the power that it needed to get big and build huge buildings and go all over the world no i got off track there didn't i no the gasoline went in the engine so that the church could accelerate the kingdom. So that the church could go out and say, it doesn't have to be how it used to be. Things are different now. Here's the year of the Lord. In Christ, everybody gets to go back to square one. Jubilee. Everybody gets to start over. Whole new world. Because when Noah's ark landed on Mount Ararat, the word Ararat in the Hebrew means the curse is reversed. When the door opened, Noah stepped out into a whole new world. At Calvary, God put the curse that was supposed to be on you on Jesus so that when the door of the tomb opened, the new you steps out at a place where the curse is reversed, and guess what's there? A whole new world. I, I can't believe no one really shouted on that. I've just, I was... So excited. I, I know you go, well, that's old hat. We know that, Pastor. But let's not forget the beauty of that. Oh, man, you are in a whole new world with Christ. Now, let me show you what he read. Isaiah chapter 61. Keep your finger here. Don't leave. Get, throw, good, put your ribbon in or pencil, bookmark, little kid, whatever. Isaiah chapter 61. I want to show you what Jesus saw in the fourth chapter of Luke. Here's his text. Isaiah 61.1, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because he has, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Notice there's nothing about blind people in that one. That's Jesus' addition. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, don't lose Isaiah. Just flip back to Luke 4. Don't lose it. Stay, hold on to it. Look at verse 18 and 19 of Luke 4. Probably most of your translations, it's written in red. Notice the 19th verse. 
to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, verse 20, then he closed the book. Let's read it again. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and then he closed the book. Go back to Isaiah 61. Verse 2. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now let's act like he didn't close the book. Let's read the next line. And the day of vengeance of our God. Why does he leave it out? He closes the book. Technically, the author who knows exactly how we're going to translate stuff, 2,000 years, you know, about 1,600 years before we ever bother to, has to know that he's stopping in the middle of a verse. <laughs> now, when he's reading, he's not stopping in the middle of a verse. But he is stopping in the middle of a sentence. He's stopping in the middle of a thought. You can go back to Luke 4. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, but Jesus does not say, and the day of the vengeance of our God. He doesn't quote it all. And so the crowd looks at him and fixes their eyes, end of 20, and then he starts to talk again. And listen, everybody there has most of the Torah memorized. They know the next line is supposed to be the day of the vengeance of our God. And let me tell you what they've been waiting on. They have not been waiting on the Spirit of the Lord to anoint a man to preach good tidings to the poor. They have not been waiting on the recovering of sight to the blind. They have not been waiting on the bruised to be set at liberty. They have been waiting on the day of the vengeance of the Lord our God. We cannot wait for Caesar to get what is his. Church, can you tell now why my stomach turns once in a while at what I see and hear out of the American church? It is like we cannot wait for somebody to get what we think is coming to them and we stand with bated breath waiting on God to open his mouth again and when Jesus opens it, I think the crowd takes a collective breath. They're waiting. Here it comes. Here lower the hammer. And yet Jesus says this in verse 21, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing and he doesn't bother to read the part they really want fulfilled. Why? Because the day of the vengeance of our God was not there when Jesus arrived. The day that was there when Jesus arrived was the acceptable year of the Lord. Now I believe the days of vengeance, which you can pick up in the 63rd chapter of Isaiah, the first six verses are going to show you a man whose visage is drenched in blood. He mirrors the blood to the horse's bridle in the book of Revelation that goes uh, 200 miles, the old Greek says 200 strata from the horse's bridle. Did you know that Palestine, north to south, is approximately 200 miles long? God's trying to tell you in the book of Revelation that there's a day coming when Palestine will be flooded in blood and an enemy will come in and drench his clothes in the blood of the Jews. And that happened exactly one generation after Jesus said it would when he said this generation shall not pass away until they see all of these things fulfilled. There's a day of vengeance coming in which not one stone shall be left unturned on this temple. And he looks at the Jews and says, your house shall be left unto you desolate. And then about 30, less than 37 years later, the day of vengeance falls and everything is leveled in Jerusalem. The temple is pulled one stone from the other. The genealogical records of Israel's history are burned. The priesthood is destroyed and slaughtered. Israel has nothing left and 1.2 million Jews die on crosses outside of Jerusalem. It didn't start. The day of vengeance didn't start in AD 70. It started at Calvary. It started outside the camp. In the book of Revelation, when the blood is to the horses' bridles, it says it happens outside the camp. Why? Because it starts on a hill called Calvary and lasts until the last drop of blood falls and Jerusalem is no more. Their house completely left unto them desolate. The day of vengeance was not where Jesus arrives someday in your future. God's anger is finished. The day of vengeance was God pouring out his wrath on a people who had crucified his own son. And he gave them every opportunity and every chance. In fact, Jesus said, I have come for nobody but the lost sheep of the house of Israel. While I am here and I am walking, they still have a chance. This is why he preached so hard to the preachers. 
This is why he preached so hard to the synagogue and to the tabernacle. And that day when he looks at the crowd and he says, today is this scripture fulfilled in your ears, what he was saying is, don't look to me for vengeance. I'm not here to overthrow Caesar. I'm here to pick poor people up. I'm here to help that man on the Samaritan road. I'm here for Zacchaeus to come down out of a tree and eat a sandwich with me at his house. I'm here for blind Bartimaeus. I'm here for the widow's son at Nain. I'm here for Jairus' 12-year-old daughter. I'm here to dry up issues of blood. I am not here to smite people down with fire from heaven. You do not know what spirit you be of. That day is coming, Jesus said. But for now, the Son of God, the Son of Man, has arrived on the scene. Listen, once the vengeance was done, all we have left standing is a king in a kingdom. Do you realize that you don't have time to stand around mad at the world you have a kingdom to spread. You're mad in the wrong era. You were born 20 centuries too late. Thank God you're alive in a time when the kingdom can be spread simply by faith. You don't have to kill sheep. You don't have to kill bullocks. You don't need a temple in Jerusalem. You are a temple. It's the best piece of news I heard since I heard Yes, Jesus loves me. And that was good news. So what makes him so mad? Why the rage? Because look at 28. All those in the synagogue, when they heard those things, were filled with rage. Verse 22. So all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words. Why did I say they were gracious words? Because they saw what he left out. Grace is what you don't deserve. Which proceeded out of his mouth, and they said, look, look at their response. Is this not Joseph's son? Can you, can you handle a little cross-reference? Keep your finger right here. Go to Matthew 13. We're going to go real fast. Matthew 13. I'm having so much fun tonight. I'm enjoying myself. You can tell, can't you? Matthew 13, listen to this, verse 53. Now, it came to pass when Jesus had finished these parables that he departed from there, and when he had come to his own country... He taught them. I, I believe that the 13th chapter of Matthew is happening in the 4th chapter of Luke. Matthew's not in chronological order. Okay. He taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, and his sisters? Are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? I think this proves my theory that Jesus didn't, have, didn't run around talking about everything until he was baptized in the River Jordan. They met Jesus when he was 25, and he built, he, he worked with his hands, with his dad. He didn't fire out all this wisdom. And so that day in Nazareth, when he comes up with this day, is this scripture fulfilled in your ears? They went, who does this kid think he is? I know who, he built the shed outside our house. Isn't his dad Joseph and his mom Mary? We know his brothers. We know his, this is how people talk. We know his brother. I went to school with his sister. I worked with his dad. I remember him running around, little snotty-nosed Jesus, running around. You got a problem with him being snotty nose? People go, I never had a snotty nose. I think all kids do just for the fun of it. Just so they can have something to lick when they get hungry. Oh, come on now. You had to push it, Pastor. <laughs> had to lighten it up just a little bit. Luke chapter 4, go back. I, that was just an aside, an addendum. That just helped explain it. Luke chapter 4. 23, you will surely say this prophet to me, physician, heal yourself. Whatever we've heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. In other words, you're going to want me to do here what I did there. The problem is you don't believe here for what I can do there, and here's why you don't believe. Now, the rage is about to come from something that I think is a little bit underpreached. What Jesus is about to do is totally expose an old Jewish way of praying. If you were a Jew, you woke, if you were a man in Israel, every morning when you woke up, you said, God, I thank you. I thank you. That you didn't make me a woman? I'm serious. That's what a, Jew, that's what a man prayed every morning. And I pray, thank you that you didn't make me a woman, that you didn't make me a leper, and that you didn't make me a Gentile. Okay? And then they went about their business. So lo and behold, Jesus comes along in Luke chapter 4, verse 25, and says, I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heavens were shut up three and a half years, and there was a great famine throughout all the land, but to none of them was Elijah sent except Zarephath in the region of Sidon. Did you know that Sidon, Jews do not live in Sidon? 
Tyre and Sidon is the place where the Syrophoenician woman asked Jesus to cast the, the demon out of her daughter. Jesus is saying, in the three and a half years of famine, do you not think there were a lot of widows that needed the prophet Elijah to come to their house and restore their oil? Yet God didn't send Elijah to one Jew's house. Instead, he sent Elijah to a Gentile's house, completely undeserving. And then to prove his point, he goes on one more verse. And he says, and there were a whole lot of lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha, the prophet, and yet not one of them was cleansed except Naaman, the Syrian. Naaman is a general in a Syrian army, not a Jewish army. He's not a Jew. He's a Gentile. And he's the only guy that during the ministry of the prophet Elisha ever gets healed of leprosy. A woman, a leper, both Gentiles. And Jesus says, I say to you, this is what Jesus is saying. This is what infuriates. This is what gets the crowd in a rage. Jesus said, I have come to give you the prongs of the kingdom. I'm here to change people's status lifestyle, past, present, and future. I don't care about overthrowing your Caesar. I don't care about sitting on your throne. In fact, my Father has always preferred for the people that reject Him first, get Him last. How many of you think there were widows on this earth when Elijah for three and a half years had no rain falling and yet my Father didn't send Elijah to one of you? Instead, he sent Elijah to one that wasn't one of you. How many of you know there were lepers on every street corner when Elisha walked the earth? But my daddy didn't send Elisha to one leper in Israel. Instead, he let a Syrian general get the greatest healing of leprosy the world has ever seen. And do you know why? This is Jesus' message that day. Because the kingdom of God is not about what you do who you are, what you've earned. I like to say it better this way. The kingdom is not a kingdom for some. The kingdom is a kingdom for all. And he was looking at a crowd that wanted a kingdom for some. And when he told them, forget it, because it ain't ever worked that way. My daddy gave oil to a Gentile. My daddy healed a Gentile when all of you needed oil and all of you needed healed and not one of you got it. You know why? Because you've always tried to be the only ones that get daddy. But this ain't a kingdom of some. This is a kingdom of all. This is why I will not apologize for the open door policy of this church. I don't care who you are or what you've done or what your past this is a place where you are welcome because this is not a kingdom for some that speak in tongues or read the verses that we do or agree with our eschatology or like the way we baptize or get off on the way Michael plays his guitar. This is not a kingdom for some. This is a kingdom for all. I don't care what your skin color is. I don't care how much money you make. I don't care who your parents were. I know in a town where it matters who daddy was and who owned the building next to your house and, and where grandpa planted the field, none of that matters when you step into the kingdom. It don't matter who daddy was. It don't matter where your house is at. It don't matter how much money you got in the bank. In the kingdom, Jesus said, I've come to make sure the poor know it's for them. I've come to make sure male and female know it's for them. I've come to make sure black and white know it's for them. What Jesus was doing was revolutionary, and it infuriated his crowd. Everybody there that day went into a rage. I, I can't imagine vis visibly the scene that unfolds right here. And it's tough for us, because we read this and go, gosh, why are they getting so mad? But we're not realizing how religious the world into which Christ came was and how close they were for anybody else getting the kingdom. When Jesus comes into town on his way to the cross in Mark 10, Mark 11, and they're throwing down those little olive branches, Palm Sunday, and Jesus comes in on the donkey, and the, the crowd, oh, Hosanna to God in the highest, who giveth us the kingdom of David. And I think Jesus went, man, they didn't get it. I'm not here to give them the kingdom of David. That's Jews. Have you ever wondered the, the, the pain? Jesus is standing. Acts chapter 1, cross is over. 
Resurrection's over. Ascension's coming up. Disciples look at Jesus and say, every time I read it, now, I used to didn't think anything of it. But the more I realized the kingdom is ours, the more I realized Jesus had to just think, boy, you guys need the Holy Ghost. Because remember, Jesus had just told him before he went to the cross, there's a whole bunch of stuff I want to tell you, but you can't handle it because you don't have the Holy Ghost yet. And you have the Holy Ghost, you'll be able to handle it. That means Jesus was holding a bunch of info back. Don't worry, he ain't going to hold it back from you. You got the Holy Ghost. Isn't that good news? He gave it all to the Apostle Paul, Peter, James. He said, here, get, tell them all. Tell, tell them everything. He's stand, about to ascend, and the disciples go, Lord, when shall you restore again the kingdom unto Israel? Have you ever thought Jesus had to just, you know, I know he's so loving. He's not like me. I would have just walked out. I had to push my lectern over and just knock the microphone over and said, I'm sick of this business and I'm preaching this every week. When are you going to restore the kingdom again to Israel? And Jesus says, it's not. It's the Father's time and season for everything, okay? But you, but, but, rebuttal, conjunction, another thought, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost comes upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem in Judea in Samaria I'm, ge I'm moving out geographically and unto the uttermost parts of the earth Jesus said quit asking me when the kingdom's coming back to Israel haven't you learned it ain't ever coming to Israel it's going to start in you and you're going to take it to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Ladies and gentlemen, you are in a kingdom with a king who wants to see this stuff happening in us. Don't worry if it upsets you. It made them so mad. Am I in the book? It made them so mad they grabbed him physically. They haul him outside of the synagogue and they are ready to commit murder. Forget thou shalt not kill. This one deserves to die. And as they're about to cast him over, I closed it, but I don't want to close it. Luke 4, look with me one more time. 29, they rose up and thrust him out of the city and they led him to the brow of the hill in which their city was built that they might throw him down over the cliff. Number 30, verse 30. Then, passing through the midst of them, he went his way. I don't know how he did it. But until it was time, they couldn't have him. I think he... You're going to go, coo -coo -coo. stay with me. I think he went invisible. Hey, Jesus had the ability to appear in glorified body at transfiguration. Following the resurrection, he even had the ability to, to blind the eyes of the disciples on the road to Emmaus. I think that day at Nazareth when they were about to throw him over the temple, all over the cliff, 75 feet to his death, it's not time to die. He ain't done nothing. All he did was preach. We get in more trouble for preaching than anything. They're about to cast him off, and he goes through the midst of them. I think Jesus disappears, but here's what's more important. Whether he disappears or not, I don't, it doesn't bother. I don't, I don't really care. What I do care about is the last line of the verse. He went his way. The kingdom is going to be his way. <laughs> his cross was going to happen his way. Healing was going to happen his way. He's going to build his church his way. He's going to pour out his spirit on the church his way. And it ain't Pastor Paul's business. I serve a sovereign God. I don't have to ask God why he does things the way he does it. I just trust that he knows what he's doing. He can build it his way. I'm meeting them from all over the world, and they talk about my Jesus like they know him. Yet they don't line up with a lot of the stuff I thought you used to have to line up with to be saved. And you know what I hear the Holy Spirit saying? I'm going to build this thing my way. <laughs> That'll humble you real quick, too, I'm telling you. The Holy Spirit says, I'm going to build this thing my way. On this rock, Jesus said, I'll build my church. I don't need your church growth, church growth seminar. You don't have to go read your manual on how to build your church next Sunday. He said, on this rock, I'll build my church, but listen to what I'm going to give you. I shall give you 
the keys to what? I'm going to build my church, but I'm going to hand you the keys of the kingdom. I'm going to teach you how to put these points of light into people's lives. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Here's what he was saying. Whatever you bind on this dimension is bound in the next dimension. Whatever you loose in this dimension, whatever you loose on earth is loosed in the heavenlies. Loose, loose heaven into people's life. You have the key. Jesus looked at a group of Pharisees one time and he said, you have the key, but you, have den- you don't use it and you've denied anybody else from using it. And that, corresponds with I shall give you my church the keys to the kingdom don't worry about building the church I'll build the church you spread the kingdom hallelujah be a kingdom spreader this week are you glad for Christ's proclamation of the kingdom there's always more that can be said I love just stand up here and talk to you about his king about the king and kingdom all the time but I'm gonna let you go I I feel like I've given you a lot tonight and I took you on, to some, on some journeys, I know. If I've expanded your thinking, you got about 15 copies of this at home. Just dig in, all right? I don't claim to always be right, but I'm digging in, okay? And what I'm doing is looking for him in its pages. I want to find Jesus. So when I get up here, I want to make Jesus look good. We, can be acu- we get accused of a lot of stuff here. But I yet to have been accused of not making Jesus look good. And that's what I'm the most proud of right now. Is go, we're making Jesus look good. That's, that's my goal. I want Christ to look good in your life. Would you stand? I'm going to let you go home. This weekend, 8.30, 10.30, there is no telling what will happen in this house. I don't know if you missed on, if you missed on Sunday. You missed a blessing, I think. God moved. We had six people that raised a hand to commit to Christ in the late service on Sunday morning at 1030. That was awesome. And we had the second largest crowd, the second largest crowd we've ever counted, um, excluding this past Easter. We had the second largest crowd we've ever counted on Sunday when you count both services together. 830 was a record Sunday morning. And then 1030 was very, very good. We didn't do anything. That's my point. I don't know how to build this thing. People just show up because they want to see Jesus. I don't know what, who's going to be here Sunday. If there's 20 of them, we're going to preach Jesus to 20 of them. Uh, if there's 20,000, we're going to preach to that. And everybody said, praise. I love that. We grab hold of that in Jesus' name. Why not? The more people you can tell about Jesus, the better. But we'll be here 8.30, 10.30, but ready to go to give the good news of Jesus Christ. You don't want to miss it. Tell somebody about Jesus this week, okay? I want to, there's an offering place right here. They're, they're kind of behind the little lip. If you, if you want to give when you go, we appreciate whatever you can do into the ministry and into the work of the ministry. This gospel goes out free by Internet all over the world, and we've never turned anyone down that writes or calls and asks for material and can't pay for it. We've never turned them down, and we don't have any plans on ever turning them down. It doesn't even matter how much they order. I'm not even scared to say that. We don't care. God's always been good to supply. He's going to keep doing that. It's freely been given to us. We try to freely give as many people as we can. The gospel of grace is accelerating all over the world, and we're glad to just be a part of it. Be a part of that tonight. Help us out if you can. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful that you are so good. God, I am always amazed at how wonderful you are and how beautiful your word is. We saw your son tonight with such passion in his eyes such fire in his voice i can see him that day when he proclaims the points of the kingdom and the rage that was accompanied at him just proclaiming that it's not for some it's for all god it helps us feel as if whatever opposition we might get for your finished work it's good to know that jesus was proclaiming a gospel not for some but for all and we want to be in good company and we ask that you give us each one of us this week the insight, the heart, the passion, the purpose to tell somebody about a man named Jesus so that they too can see the kingdom in their lives. In, and bless this offering. As all over the world, people are being fed by grace. We thank you. We praise you. We glorify you. In Jesus' name, everyone said amen.